This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Downey, and again, you're in uh, the final session of Club Officer Training for 2022. We're going to talk about membership and communications, particularly tonight. I'm going to start, as I always do, with a prayer. And uh, this is a prayer. I don't know where I got it, but it's a nice prayer, and it seems appropriate right now at this time of the year as young people are graduating from high school. If you just follow along silently in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, this is called a prayer for young people who are coming to the end of their education in high school or in college. Lord, help these young people to listen attentively to your word. Help them to make wise decisions for their future, which are inspired by faith in you. Help each of us at whatever stage in life to be open to what you are calling us to do and to be. We ask this in the name of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, I'm also going to start with a uh, inspirational message, as I usually do. And again, I'm going to read from Father Brett Brandon's book called, uh, to, called uh, to Save a Thousand Souls. And this story is called uh, Priests Bury the Dead. The couple spoke to me as they were leaving the Saturday Vigil Mass. They were a lovely couple and their 12-year-old son was with them. He said excitedly, Father, we're going to get a hamburger at my favorite place and then we're going bowling tonight. This couple had tried to have children for many years and they spent a lot of money going to different specialists. Finally, they conceived and had a son. But the baby had some complications, including a hole in his heart at birth which took several surgeries to repair. But he was doing great. He was attending our parish school and living the life of a normal 12-year-old boy. At nine o'clock that night, a nurse from the hospital emergency room called me and told me to come quickly. I later learned what had happened. While at the bowling alley, the boy had stood up and walked to the lane to bowl. After he bowled his ball down the lane, he turned around, grabbed his chest, and fell. The doctor said he was dead before he hit the ground. His heart had simply burst. Later that night, I was kneeling in the church with a very heavy heart. I felt so badly for the family and for their suffering. I said, Jesus, I don't think I have the strength to bury a child right now. I can't do this. Please help me. Please give me the grace to do this funeral and to minister to this family. I had never seen the church more packed than it was the day of the funeral. God helped me. He gave me the grace and I made it through the homily. After the consecration and communion, I remember thinking, Jesus, it's almost over. Thank you, Lord. The Catholic rite of committal at the cemetery is very brief, so it took a long time for all the people to park and make their way to the grave. Once I had blessed the grave and finished the final commendation, the mother looked at me and said, Father, please open the casket so I can say goodbye. I thought to myself, oh no, please don't do this. But what could I do? How could I deny the request of a mother bearing her only child? So I nodded to the funeral director to go ahead, and it was just as I suspected. The mother began to scream and cry, hugging her child in the casket. Her husband was there holding her and crying, and the family was all huddled around. It was a terrible, sad, unforgettable moment in their lives and in mine. Emotional, emotionally, I could not take it, and tears poured down my cheeks. The funeral was officially over, so I just turned away and started walking slowly among the graves, ask, acting as if I were looking for a certain name on a tombstone. I was really trying to compose myself. After a few minutes, I suddenly heard Jesus speak to me very clearly. The Lord has spoken to me many times in my life, but there have only been a few instances where his voice and message were so clear. Jesus said, thank you. And I understood in that instant that he was saying, thank you for being a priest. Thank you for bearing this child for me and thank you for ministering to his parents. I knew without any doubt that it was Jesus because his voice totally and immediately restored my emotional and spiritual strength. I went from being heavy hearted and sad, one of the lowest moments of my life, to being emotionally strong, filled with joy and happiness. I immediately began to thank and praise God. No, Jesus, I should be thanking you. Thank you, Jesus, for being my savior. Thank you for dying for me. 
thank you. But again, the Lord communicated to me very clearly. And this time he said, stop, be quiet. Right now, I just want you to let me thank you. As I walked through the cemetery, my heart was full and I prayed quietly. You're welcome, Jesus. You're welcome. I'm so glad I am a priest. This is just what priests do. That always brings some tears to my eyes. I think it's a great story, though. Okay, let's uh, dive in here. I want to use some slides from the first three sessions to just touch on some highlights of what we've already discussed. I promise I'll go through these quickly, but these are not in the support materials for session four. They were in support materials for sessions one, two, and three. So in the first session, we talked about the three distinct missions embedded in the care mission. You know, at the One beginning. To, uh, to foster new vocations to the priesthood and religious life. The second is to support and affirm existing vocations to the priesthood and religious life. And the third is to increase our holiness. These are the touchstones of all that we do in Sarah. And it's important that club activities support all three prongs of the mission. Then we dropped down or we looked at the organization structure and leadership of Sarah International. We noted there are about 12,500 members worldwide operating through about 400 clubs in 46 countries. SARA International is organized into 10 councils of which the US Council is one. And it has a board made up of representatives from the councils and the officers of SARA International. Then we dropped down and we looked at SARA US, the SARA US Council. We noted there are about 7,300 SARINs in the US, which is about 60% of all SARINs in the world, operating through about 200 clubs. And we noted that the SARA US Council is divided into nine geographic regions that are depicted on this map. Each region has a regional director, and each region in turn is divided into districts. There are a total of 44 districts across the country, each with a district governor. And that person is really critical for clubs uh, to know that they're part of something larger than just the activities in their own club, that they're part of a great effort on behalf of vocations worldwide. Then we talked a little bit about the crisis in, pre in the priesthood vocations in the US. And you know we noted in this table that new priest ordinations have been pretty consistent since 1995 basically in the 450 to 550 range, which is amazing given the, the headwinds that the church has faced during that period of time. But in spite of that, um, it has not been enough, enough to offset the loss of priests due to death and re retirement. So we have seen a continuous decline in the number of total diocesan priests in the United States from about 32,000 in 1995 to about 24,000 uh, in 2021. Then in session two, we talked about club operations. Uh, we noted that clubs are organized not by parishes, but by geographic areas within a diocese. And that means that we work with and for the vocations director and the bishop. Then we focused on the president's role in a club. Uh, this was a major focus of session two, and I noted that probably the most important thing for tr for presidents to do is to make sure that the other officers are acting as a team and not as solo players in accomplishing our mission. And I mentioned the example, for example, if you have a great communications vice president, they can't be good unless the program is laid out in advance so that they can get the information out to people in time to get it in their schedules. And vice versa, the program uh, vice president is dependent on communications, getting information out monthly to remind people of what goes on. There are actually interactions between programs, communications, vocations, and membership, and the treasure that are really important there. We talked about the importance of informing and involving the bishops and the vocations directors in the planning of our club activities for the coming year. Uh, we talked about encouraging all members to engage in some aspect of SARA. We also talked about the importance of the president encourage, encouraging members to participate in the above the club level events in SARA. That would be district councils, regional conventions, the SARA rally, and SARA international events. We talked about the importance of keeping the SARA portal updated. 
on officers and particularly email addresses. And that duty is usually shared by either the president or the treasurer. And finally, we just talked about the importance of showing the joy that comes from doing God's work through our special ministry. In terms of that president's checklist, we talked about programs and we said the most important thing is to have a master schedule for monthly meetings that's set up in advance for the entire coming year. A lot of clubs I've seen just roll month to month trying to figure out who's going to be our speaker, and they don't even talk sometimes about the topic. I think this is not the responsibility of the vocations vice president, but the responsibility of the entire officer team, because these programs are critical to everything. They're critical to communications. They're critical to the uh, vocations effort. They're especially critical to membership. So everybody needs to be involved in setting this, this master schedule for the year. And it's important that speakers be identified and topics identified and on mission for the year. It needs to be coordinated with the bishop schedule because the bishop schedule is something that won't change for Sarah meetings. If you want the bishop to be involved, you need to kind of work around his schedule first in setting this. Then we talk about the vocations checklist. And I really recommended that every president make it a point to involve every single Saren in their club in at least one vocations prayer-based activity. And that can be attendance at the first Friday or first Saturday masses. It can be a weekly or monthly rosary for vocations. It can be Eucharistic adoration, adopting a seminarian, or helping with the Newman connection. Or it can be helping with some of the vocations outreach to parishes. And those are keyed to the tools in sarahspark.org. But I think this is a great checklist point for presidents to make sure that all Sarens are involved in one vocations prayer activity. I'm not talking here about putting out a, uh, a newsletter. I'm talking about you know something that involves prayer for vocations. That's right on target on our mission. We talked about the president's checklist on membership, and this is pretty extensive, really. Um, the first one is creating awareness, letting Catholics know uh, that Sarah exists and what it's all about. And that is not the membership vice president's responsibility. That's really the president, the communications, and the vocations vice president's responsibility. We talked about inviting new members is, is a, everyone's responsibility, not just the membership vocation, uh, vice president. We talked about special prospects, information, and invitation events, and involving the bishop with that. We talked about the importance of a new member induction ceremony so that people know they're joining something that's really important. And then we talked about member retention, informing uh, basically through new member orientations and good communications, welcoming through introductions at every meeting, name badges and friendship, and finally engaging. Again, getting people immediately involved at least one vocations activity. We're gonna talk more about this tonight in membership. This is the president's checklist on communications. Um, I really like clubs that have an annual directory that has the master program for the year printed it as part of it. If you don't have that, you need to have an annual meeting program. And then your other communications involve a monthly newsletter. Um, it can be email reminders of upcoming meetings. It can be websites or social media. And it's important to maintain accurate member email addresses so that these people get the communications. And then there's communications outside the club. And again, we're gonna talk about these in a second, but those would include to the Catholic community, bulletin announcements of vocations, activities, and parishes, Catholic newspaper articles, Catholic radio, and website, uh, the website again, and Facebook. We talked a little bit about the che checklist of the president for the treasurer. Um, and I noted two things that are very important here. One is that the treasurer needs to understand that they are the person that is, is responsible for records retention. And we recommend that uh, bank accounts, membership records, and tax filings be maintained for a five-year period. And one of the other most important things that seems really small, but it's important for the president to make sure that there is a second signature on all bank accounts so that if anything happens to the treasurer, the club is not cut off from access to its funds. We talked about getting the bishop involved and informed about the club activities. And I recommended a two page letter to the bishop each year, just about the time you're gonna finish up your master program. Tell them what you did the prior year, including prayer activities, and tell them what you're planning to do the coming year in terms of both speakers and topics 
send it to the bishop and ask him in the letter if you could get a brief meeting with him in person. And then when, if he gives you that meeting, don't read the, the letter to him. He's going to have read it already. But ask the bishop for his input and recommendations. I think if we involve the bishops more in our clubs, we're going to have more effective overall um, results in terms of vocations. Okay, then in session three, we talked about vocations and programs. And we talked about the fact that the sarahspark.org website, the sarahspark tools, are the real foundation of everything that we do in terms of our vocations efforts. And these are basically the sarahspark.org website has 27 or 28 tools now that are ready to use in any parish, any diocese, or any club. It was originally designed for vocations directors, and we get constant feedback from them on things they'd like to change there. But it really gives them an edge in terms of being able to get into the role of vocations director and accomplish things right away. But they're also used by a lot of SARA clubs. And we talked about the fact that the tools fall into four categories. Affirmation, which is really in, uh, supporting our second prong of uh, supporting uh, existing priesthood and religious vocations. Awareness, which really has to do with uh, the first stage of uh, uh, the first prong, which is fostering new vocations. Invitation, encouragement, which is also related to the first prong. And prayer, which is related to all the prongs. But again, the key is sarahspark.org website. And I think all Sarans in officer positions should be familiar with the wonderful tools that are there. We talked about the fact there are really vocations efforts on two levels here. Um, the first one is efforts within the club, and that's the way it was when I was started. Almost everything my club did in the Des Moines, Air, Iowa area was within the club and involved only the club members. But at some point, Sarah has evolved to recognize that we also need to do more to get those outside the club involved in praying for vocations. So we have all kinds of activities where the club organizes it, but they're really focused on getting all Catholics to pray for vocations. In terms of vocations and activities within the club, we mentioned some of those that should be uh, familiar to you, but monthly first Friday and first, fr uh, first Saturday masses, Eucharistic adoration, weekly or monthly rosaries for vocations, priesthood Sunday, just simple things like birthday cards, Christmas cards for priests and seminarians and sisters, uh, the spiritually adopt a seminarian program, and a, a corollary to that is care packages for seminarians altar server awards and recognition, and the Newman connection. We talked about how important the bishops think that is uh, for retaining uh, young people in the faith when they go to college, and also for hearing a vocations call. And in terms of those programs outside the club, there are really three approaches that we're taking in Sarah, and these are all kind of going on concurrently. The first one is sarahsprint.org, which is uh, a program designed by Margot Getty on the Sarah International Board. Uh, the second one is the Galilee program, and both involve sending Sarans into parishes uh, to acquaint them with the sarahspark.tools, maybe leave a few behind, and then uh, both have a goal of eventually getting a parish vocations committee going in each parish. And then we have this new program that we've been doing. Um, we really started this about three years ago. The pandemic set us back a bit, but we're offering free parish vocations ministry training to any diocese that wants it. If they can pull together three to five parishes and three to five parishioners from each parish, we go in for a Saturday usually for a full day training. And uh, once the training is done, we commit one Saren to be a mentor to each parish vocations committee uh, for the following year to make monthly calls and see if they can help keep things going or answer any questions that come up. Okay. And then there are some special Sarah programs that uh, fall under the programs function. Um, we have the monthly meeting programs, which are standard. We have special programs, and we have religious appreciation events. And there, I put forward some tips on program planning. I just really said it's important to stay focused on vocations in your speakers and your topics. That's why people join Sarah. We talked about uh, uh, considering outsiders like Focus Kids. They're great speakers at a, at a program. Uh, regional officers, visiting missionaries, ordered priests, even diocesan news editors, you know, just asking them, what's the diocesan newspaper doing to support vocations? Very important to, to be sure to thank uh, Sarans, uh, to thank speakers, either with a follow-up note or some clubs choose to give a gift. 
And then uh, make sure you have some backup plans because occasionally the speaker is going to back out on you at the last minute. We gave some examples of what you can do there. These are the special SEREM programs that a lot of clubs do. They have a they organize a seminary visit by one or two uh, SEREMs from their club to a local seminary, and usually they shadow the uh, uh, the seminarians there for a weekend. I did this, and uh, I just thought it was wonderful. It left me with a feeling that the future of the church is in great hands. And then I gave the following monthly program uh, basically to report my experience. Another one is to re as a uh, half day retreat or a day of reflection. This is usually held in Advent or Lent. And finally is an annual mass to pray for deceased Sarans. Okay, that gets us through a review of sessions one, two, and three. Let's jump into session four here. Why is membership important? You know, it doesn't have to do with the dues. It has to do with the fact, and I, I like to quote Judy Cousins, who's a past president of US Sarah. He said, we are marching into a desperate battle and we need more soldiers. That's really what it comes down to is we need more people working on vocations and praying for vocations. So we need more prayers for vocations. We need more hands for service. And we need to grow our membership so that we can demonstrate to the priests and religious that there is strong support from lay Catholics for what they do. Then it's important to recognize that membership is a process. And I think sometimes we, we ignore this. Um, and I'm going to talk about each of the steps in membership here. First is creating awareness of among lay Catholics of what Sarah is, what it's all about, and that it even exists. We're going to talk about the general invitation to the Catholic community. We're going to talk about the individual invitation to an individual who might be a prospect. We're going to talk about the application form. We're going to talk about the new member induction ceremony and new member orientation. And then we're going to talk about retention, which is a very important part of membership. And that involves engaging these people in Sarah work, mentoring, and welcoming, welcoming them, uh, having good communications in advance of events and programs, having quality and inspiring monthly programs, and engaging people in leadership positions eventually, not right off the bat. So let's talk about each one of those. Talk about creating awareness of, Sarah's, of Sarah among lay Catholics. Um, this really doesn't happen, as I said, by the membership vice president. This is dependent on the president, the communications person, and the vocations vice president. Because for people that aren't in Sarah, the way they learn about it is usually the vocations programs that we have in parishes. And those would include the four national vocations awareness events, which is Priesthood, Appreciation Sunday, National Vocations Awareness Week, uh, World Day for Consecrated Life and World Day of Prayer for Vocations, which we just had a couple of weeks ago. And then there are parish-wide 31 club rosaries, much like the clubs have for vocations, uh, Eucharistic adorations for vocations, adopting a seminary and prayer boards and cards. This is usually not as, uh, doesn't have the same level of personal information that the Sarans are allowed, but it's still a way for people to pick up a card and it tells them the name, the birth day and the birth uh, and the birth month of the individual seminarian and the seminary that they're at and what what level of study they're at in the seminary so it provides enough information it has the address of the seminary too uh, so that people can send cards to support them and then there's the called by name program we talked about that last week very important program but basically it's a parish by parish effort to get all the lay Catholics at a Sunday or Saturday and Sunday mass to help identify young people in the parish who might have a vocation. They don't have to sign their name, but there's a card that provided by Sarah and they put down the name of anybody they think that the vocations director should talk to. And I mentioned the example of uh, the one of the Houston clubs did this. They provided over 70 leads to the vocations director in using that program. And it was very effective there. Altar server recognition events are important because most priests have been altar servers. And so we know it's kind of a target rich environment. And then there's just planned publicity. It's articles in the Catholic newspaper. And I suggested last week that, you, that a goal for the president should be to try to get at least two articles per year in a Catholic newspaper. And that's not as tough as you would think. If you have somebody that can just take some pictures with a phone 
and you focus on the events that take place with the bishop, uh, the Catholic newspaper will usually give you pretty good coverage in terms of a little article about that. Also, you have Catholic radio and you have bulletin announcements. We're going to talk about those. And there are also parish ministry fairs. It's a great place to put up a board uh, that tells people a little bit about Sarah as they're thinking about some of the uh, Catholic ministries that they might want to participate in. And then it's just, you know, it's, it's good to have the Sarah Prayer for Vocations card in parishes, and you can buy those very inexpensively at vianivocations.com. And then trifold brochures in the back of all churches that might be tailored to be specific to your particular club. So that's, let's talk about the general invitation. It involves some of those same things, but having a trifold brochure about Sarah. And <clears throat> it's a good idea now to have this in English and Spanish since there are so many Hispanic Catholics in the church. Bulletin announcements anytime you have any kind of a Sarah event going on, but just tell people or just put a general announcement in. <clears throat> if you're interested in vocations or you have a special place in your heart, uh, join Sarah. Business cards with contact information. A lot of clubs have these and pass them out to members, and then members in turn give that information, give the card to somebody they think might be interested in joining. <clears throat> the Sarah prayer cards are also a great way thing to pass out with contact information on the back. There's a new website called joinsarah.org. <clears throat> this is a great place to drive people to that are interested in learning more about Sarah. Um, it's not a commitment to join, it's just information. And if they want, they can fill in the information. It goes to the Chicago office and the Chicago office will help to identify the club in their area. <coughs> Excuse me here. Uh, articles in Catholic newspapers, we already talked about that, and Catholic radio. And I, I've said before that I think Catholic radio is a very underutilized tool for creating Im invitations, but Catholic radio is usually hungry for programming. And a lot of times, if you just call up and say, do you guys have some time when we could come down and talk to you about some of the things we're doing in Sarah and what Sarah's all about, you find they'll give you uh, 20 minutes to a half, half an hour sometimes to go through that in kind of an interview process. Okay, let's talk about special events to invite people. One is an annual prospect dinner. Um, this is intended to be informative only. There's no pressure to join. And a lot of times the names come from parish priests or from the bishop's office. So what, one of the things that's important is that dinner, you need to get a lot of your current Sarens there so that people see the club in its best light and realize who some of the Sarens are. Inviting prospects to club events involving the bishop. In our club, the Des Moines Club, we typically ask uh, members to invite anybody who might be a prospect to any of the events that involve the bishop. Like I said here, lay Catholics just love to rub shoulders with their bishop, and uh, this is a great way to do it. And finally, ask the bishop and the vocations director to regularly su suggest uh, Sarah membership is a way for lay Catholics to actively participate in the diocese vocations efforts. Let's talk about the individual invitation. Who should you make that to? So here's some ideas. I think that 40 to 70 year olds are our primary target. These are people that have become empty nesters. And I don't know if you'd call it a midlife crisis, but I think at this particular point, a lot of people uh, are looking for uh, another set of values in their life uh, versus just uh, earning money and uh, you know possessions and so forth. And so I think this is the target group that we really want to focus on. A great place to look for those people is at daily mass and also Eucharistic adoration. Those participants typically have a very deep understanding and love for priests, and so they'd make great candidates for Sarens. Uh, parents and relatives of priests, but especially seminarians and deacons, seminarians in particular, those people are going through a period where their children are making decisions, and Sarah is kind of a support uh, vehicle for them. But uh, a lot of seminarians' parents are, are Sarens because of that. Adults that are in charge of altar server and youth ministry programs, those people have great connections with young people. And uh, if you can get them and Sarah, they in turn can turn around and make sure that they're passing the message about vocations on to the young people in the parish. If you have a parish vocations committee, the members of that committee should be natural candidates for Sarah. 
If you have Catholic friends, you should talk to them. You know, don't be afraid to tell people about Sarah. It's not a secret. It's something that's uh, uh, widely endorsed by the church. In fact, we're the only lay Catholic apostolate that's actually part of the worldwide Catholic church. Those recently widowed, they're sort of like the empty nesters, but they're looking at uh, a way to fill a hole in their life. And there's no better way to do that than praying for vocations through a Sarah club. And finally, the tough one is parishes that have no seminarians and or have no Sarans. And there you're pretty much dependent <clears throat> on recommendations from the parish priest. But those are places you can look for making individual invitations. Now we're going to talk about in what you do when you identify those people. And I suggest you invite with a strategy. Um, the best clubs I've seen actually triple team a prospect. Once they've identified one, they assign three people and those people all go after them. So the first time they get asked, they almost always say no. And the, the, the second time they usually say no. But by the time you ask a third time, you'll find that a lot of people are thinking, hmm, you know, maybe I should consider this. You know, plan the invitation to join and uh, make sure you know what you're going to say. Um, again, some some of the best clubs actually contact Pete prospects twice. And that kind of goes along with the old rule for marketing that it takes seven touches to really reach a person. And then talk about the conversation here. You know, what do we say when we actually invite somebody, one individual to join Sarah? The first and most important thing is be excited and be joyful when you're talking about Sarah. A lot of people like to share a mountaintop experience, something that was really special in your life that was related to Sarah. It might be a chance to, something you had a chance to talk to the bishop about. It could be a retreat. Uh, it could be one of the new priests. It could be a seminarian that you spiritually adopted. And share that impact on your own spirituality. Um, you know, seminarians, if your club is active in this, um, we send seminarians birthday cards and Christmas cards no. and Easter cards. And in almost all cases, no. the, the seminarians are just mm -hmm. wonderful to send you back thank you notes. I mean, we just get buried with thank you notes. And uh, I would save those and I would take those when you go to talk to a person and say, let me just show you some of the comments that we've had from some of the seminarians thanking us for our work. And then Talk about support of priests, sisters, bishop, and the vocations director. Those are key things that we do in terms yeah. of existing yeah. vocations. Yeah. And uh, you need to address the cost. And I usually would put it in terms of a per month cost and what is accomplished by the dues. You need to remind people, though, it's not about what you get out of it. It's what you give. It's God's work. And it's about the future of our church. So that's the conversation. Now. Be prepared for objections because you're going to get some on occasion. So these are the three mm -hmm. most common objections. The first one mm -hmm. is, I can pray for vocations without being a serent. Technically, that's true. But but let me tell you something. You know, um, our Episcopal advisor for Sarah International, Cardinal Tom Collins, gave us a talk once at one of the Sarah rallies. And he said, action follows prayer. He says, almost all important prayers, and especially vocation prayers, call us to some kind of action to put those prayers into practice. And Sarah clubs are really the only effective way to, to take prayers and put them into action in terms of our Sarah mission of supporting and fostering new vocations. Um, so, and, and, and I also think that uh, it may be true that you can pray without being a Saren, but I don't think it's as effective. It's individual, it's not in groups, and I don't think it's as consistent or has the quality that Sarah gives to the prayers for vocations. Um, second objection you're going to run to is the dues seem too high. And again, I think it's important to state those in terms of a monthly cost and give examples of what they accomplish. And then a third one that comes up a lot is I'm not sure what the priest abuse scandal and all. Here's my point on that. It's never been more important to affirm and support the many good priests and religious that have been unfairly tarred by the scandal. It's just an even more important reason to join Sarah and be part of it. So be prepared for those objections when you talk to somebody. Okay, I want to mention to you what I call the Texas Magic membership envelope. 
Tex some clubs in Texas have had incredible results in gaining membership. And what they did is they put together an envelope. The, the envelope itself is a self-addressed stamped envelope with a stamp on it, and it's addressed to the treasurer of the club. Inside the envelope is an application form, a membership brochure, a SARA card, and information about the kinds of things that SARA provides to parishes uh, as a result of some of the dues. And what they do is they just hand these out to people they think are good prospects and ask them to fill in the application form and send it back in, uh, just put it in the envelope, seal the envelope, and send it on in with a, a check there for the uh, initiation fees. But it has been incredibly successful where it's been used. Let's talk about the application form for a second. Um, I am not a favor of the application form that's used by Sarah International. I'll just tell you that right up front. I think it's very confusing to prospects. And on page 5A of the support documents that you have, there is a blank application form. Now, I know a lot of clubs, clubs just hand this out like it is. I would not recommend handing this out blank because I think there's too much stuff on it that leaves questions in people's minds about what, how they're supposed to fill it in. For example, sponsor information. If somebody gives you this and it says your signature is sponsor, but it's not filled in, they're wondering, well, who, who am I going to get to sponsor myself? Um, and how about pastor's approval? So the way that and at the bottom is information to be filled out by the club. This used to be at the top of the form, and this is stuff that no prospect would know. So what I have in page 5B and 5C is an approach that my club uses, and they kind of uh, took this and rewrote the application form so that uh, the top sections are clearly information that has to be provided by the, by the prospect, but they already have in blank, uh, they have a signature of a sponsor. They had the com communications vice president of the club sign every one of these in blank, they had the, the president of the club sign as a trustee in blank. And then we got our club chaplain, whether it's fair or not, uh, we got our club chaplain to say, would you just sign these for us so we don't have to bother you every time one comes in? And he said, no problem, and he signed it. And then they copied this, and this is what they send out or give out to somebody who's a prospect. So all the person has to provide is their own personal information. And then there's a second page that kind of describes uh, what the what the club's all about, how you join, and what the dues are. I think that's really important. So, you know, I'd recommend an approach like that if you can, uh, in terms of uh, using the application form with people that you think are good prospects for the club. You know, this section here about the pastor's approval. You know, I know that's supposed to be individual, but and the idea there is that the pastor sort of certifies that the person is a good practicing Catholic. But the fact of the matter is the priests are incredibly busy. And the last thing they need to be doing is filling out forms. And also, it's unlikely that they're going to know the prospect as well as we do. So uh, in our case, the chaplain just said, I'm willing to trust you guys. that You're picking out people that are good practicing Catholics, and I'll just sign these in blank and we'll go. So it's just an idea there, but again, I would never hand that out in blank. I think it's just confusing to people and you'll never get it back. And when you do hand, hand it out, do like the Texans do, put it in, include a self-addressed stamped envelope with the treasurer's address, and then follow up to make sure that the treasurer has received it. You know, that's the important thing. Otherwise, it's just going to be lost in the process here. So that's the application form. Let's talk about the initiation fee. For Sarah International and Sarah US, there are no dues uh, owed by the club for the first six month period that a person joins the club. All that's required is the $11.75 fee. And uh, you know that's important because it's a way for them to step into it easily. Now, if you're a club that charges for food as part of your dues, you're going to want to add to that in another place so that they pay for the, the meals that are coming up so that, you know, the club isn't out of pocket there. But a lot of clubs have gotten out of the habit of paying this initiation fee. Um, they, the treasurers let it pile up and then they send it in usually either the 1st of January or the 1st of July. 
And the problem with that is, is that that delays all those people from receiving the communications from Sarah US and Sarah International. And in addition, now this is new in the last two years, but it does cover uh, a kit that includes a new member pin, a handbook and a certificate and about uh, Sarah and their membership. So there's a lot of good stuff there. So that initiation fee is really a deal. And you know, if you wanna be clever and I am too, I'm kind of cheap in a lot of ways. If somebody joins uh, on December 31st, I might just be tempted to hold that application and that check for 1175 until January 2nd and send it in because it covers the dues till Janu from January through uh, the end of June. So there's no reason you have to, uh, you know, have people uh, kind of formally introduced to the, the higher dues at, at this point. Okay, let's talk about the new member induction ceremony. Uh, this is actually, if you're looking for it, I can provide it to you, but it's also on the club officers, district governors resource page on sarahus.com. And uh, it's kind of a lengthy thing and we're, we're trying to get that reworked by the membership committee this year so that there's a short version and a long version. But a lot of times it happens at a mass and it's just great if you can involve the bishop or the vocations director or the chaplain in that thing. Um, it's a great place to deliver the new member kit with the Sarah pin that it has. And again, like I said, it's usually a ceremony as part of or following the mass. So, but the, the new member induction ceremony is important from the point of view of letting people know that they belong to something important. Okay, uh, let's talk about new member orientation. Once you get them in, you need to let them know what Sarah is all about in more details here. So, you know, there are some different options on how this is done. The Omaha clubs I know actually have a meeting once a year for all the new members with the club officers. And they have, for example, the vice president of uh, vocations gets up, talks about what that committee does and encourages people to join. The vice president of membership gets up and talks about what their committee does and invites people to join and so forth for communications and also uh, I'm missing here programs. So that's one approach. The difficulty with that is, is that people tend to join Sarah clubs all through the year. And that makes it difficult to get everybody together and a lot of clubs wait and wait and wait and then they never get it done. So another approach is to use the new member orientation, which is a recorded webinar. It's about 36 minutes and it has three breaks built in it for discussion. Um, and we really encourage that uh, you not just pass that out or send the link to an individual member, but to have one of the, at least one club officer present when people look at that um, so that they can explain what's special about their club. And the link for that is there at the bottom of the page. And I just want to comment too that the new member orientation webinar is being used by a lot of clubs as a monthly program as a way to kind of refresh all members. And there's a lot of Sarah members that really never went through a new member orientation. And this is a way to make sure that they uh, actually have uh, the information about what Sarah is about. So new member orientation is a great step there. Now let's talk about retaining members. It's important to engage new members immediately in club vocations work. So ways to do that, we've already talked about this, weekly or monthly club rosaries, Eucharistic adorations, have them spiritually adopt a seminarian or help with the Newman connection. And then in addition to that, um, you know, mentor and welcome them. Uh, we have a lot of clubs that actually have a mentoring program where they basically escort people to the first six meetings of the year after people join. And then I think it's important at every meeting to have every member, whether they're new or old, introduce themselves at every meeting. I was, uh, I joined the St. Sarah Club of Des Moines about 20 years ago, and I, I was in it for three years and I couldn't put names with faces at all. And it really didn't happen until uh, we got a new president and she started every meeting by having every single person stand up, say their name, say what parish they're from and say how long they'd been in Sarah. And that was the first time that I really had a chance to put a name with a face. I think that this constant introduction is something that we overlook in Sarah. And then name badges are really important. You know, you don't have to have the fancy ones that are permanent. You can just use these uh, paper labels that you just stick on and you can throw away at the end of the meeting. 
but it's a good way for to help people put names with faces. And it's really important for the older veterans to go around and to say hello at meetings. That welcoming is really critical to making people feel part of SARA. Okay, here's another one, advanced communications of programs and events. You know, regular newsletters are really important, whether they're emailed or sent out in hard copy, and then reminders of those programs coming up. But again, that depends on having the programs all laid out in advance so that you can get it out, get the information out in time for people to get it into their schedules. And that goes back to quality monthly programs. Your programs really need to be scheduled out in advance and they need to, you need to think about the, these programs as a way to inspire and motivate members, not just to fill a slot. So, you know, having specific uh, people that are focused on vocations and having topics identified for those speakers that relate to vocations. And finally, let's talk about engaging new members in leadership positions. A major mistake that clubs make is, uh, a lot of clubs make is that new people come in, they're all fired up and they got a lot of passion. And what results is that they, they get in, they be, somebody asks them, you'd be a great membership vice president or a great vocations vice president. The trouble is they haven't been there long enough to really know how the club operates. So I really want, want to encourage clubs to avoid throwing new people into officer positions that haven't had any club experience. I would encourage them to be part of a team or a committee and help those vice presidents in their particular functions. And then the other thing I would do is encourage new members to attend the regional conventions, um, the SARA rally and the SARA international conventions and any conference calls that take place. Okay, here's a slide that I decided to stick in. I wasn't sure where to put it, but one of my priorities for this year is to try and uh, help clubs attract younger Catholics in the 45 to 55 year old uh, group to join SARA. And I wanna tell you, there are some strategies that we're gonna follow here. Um, some of these are available to the clubs and some of them are gonna depend on the US Council's uh, leadership to follow through on. I think that the most hopeful one is focus alumni. And if you remember, FOCUS is the fellowship of Catholic university students. They're these young kids that give two years of their life to go and evangelize on a Catholic college campus. Well, they that program has been going for long enough now that they have a substantial number of alumni, you know, people that serve the two years and are out and have their own families. They're usually great Catholics. They have a heart for vocations like you can't believe. And if you can believe it, there are now 50,000 focus alumni in the United States. And what we're trying to do is to work something out with focus so that they will provide us with uh, uh, locations and email addresses of these alumni so that we can in turn figure out how to get those to the right clubs and encourage those people to join SARA. Focus is very interested in it because they wanna see their people land in a good solid place in the church and they think SARA is one of those. So. That's one of the things we're working on. Um, at the Sarah Rally last year, uh, Wayne Schneider from uh, Kansas City, Missouri was there and he talked about another uh, Catholic organization that has what they call a legacy program. And in that program, he said that Sarans are asked to provide, to, to uh, get one person to replace them in the program before they leave. And he said in a lot of cases, it can be, uh, uh, a, a child or a nephew or a niece, uh, or it can be somebody else. But the idea is to get somebody younger so that there is a legacy that continues in the family, in the club. And again, another one is just tap into other Catholic lay organizations. And there were many mentioned in that meeting. I, I don't, uh, I didn't record all the ones that were there, but I think there are a lot of Catholic lay organizations that we overlook that we shouldn't. Okay, let's talk briefly about what happens when a member quits. You know, it's really important to find out why and to let the president and the vice president membership know and to keep the data so you can understand what's happening. A lot of times people are gonna say, we don't, I don't really have time to participate in all the things Sarah does. And one of the things you should do in that case is to encourage them to become what we call friends of Sarah or emeritus members. And these are people that don't have time, but they do have money that they're willing to contribute to Sarah. And they simply just make a donation of whatever they determine is right by themselves to the Sarah Club to help with vocations activities. And the Sarah Club in turn continues to include them in newsletter mailings, um, in all the prayer-based events that take place. 
And of course, because they're not technically members of SARA, there is no U.S. Council or SI dues that are, uh, that are involved, which is a good thing in one hand, but the other hand is you don't want to abuse that because um, those dues accomplish a lot of good things. And we talked about a long list of those in session one. But still, if people are going to quit, but they still have the interest and the financial uh, interest in participating, uh, this is an approach to take. And finally, about uh, membership, just remember, it's about sharing the joy of Sarah, so be a joy-filled Saren. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there uh, and ask if there's any questions or comments. I see I've got a couple of uh, chat messages here. Um, somebody said they couldn't hear me, Terry Prince. I hope you found a way around that. And uh, she's in the Portland area. She said she had no audio. Boy, I hope, can other people hear me out there? I hope I haven't been talking yeah. to an empty hall here. Yes, I have been able <laughs> to hear, hear you. Okay, good, good. Any other questions or comments about membership? Okay, sounds like I wowed the group, so I'm going to go ahead here. Um, we will proceed. Let's talk about communications. We're going to talk first about internal communications within the club to its Sarans, and second is external communications to Catholics about Sarah. So here are some thoughts on internal communications. Communications are really critical to membership retention. As I've told people, it's hard for them for people to belong if they don't know what's happening. And sometimes that's not strictly just communications. That may mean that there's a program that's being uh, concocted month to month. And by the time the word gets out, everybody's schedule is filled. So having good, inspiring programs that are set out in advance is really important in SOAR communications. The communications tools that are available to clubs, for most, it's a newsletter or minutes. Um, some have an annual directory, which I really encourage. And I encourage that to include the master schedule for the year. Some clubs have websites, but I just want to remind you that um, it's important to keep websites current. One of the things that turns people off very quickly will they'll just close down a website is if they see that it's out of date. And finally, there's a whole bunch of other techniques, uh, emails that I think we all use. There are call trees, teleblasts, newsletters, Facebook, WhatsApp, GroupMe, and Viber. And I want to tell you about one in particular. I'm going to see if I can uh, get that up here. Uh, this is, uh, there are several clubs that have started to use this particular service here. It's called Dial My Calls, all one word, Dial My Calls, plural. No. Com. And uh, I know that the uh, St. Louis Sierra Club, which was one of the largest no. in the U.S., I think has 180 mm. members, uh, uses this. And it basically can send out um, automated text messages and voice broadcasts to, once you put the, the phone numbers in there. And I also know that the Southeast Kansas City Club has started to use this. They're a much smaller club of about 50, but they still think it, uh, that it's, it's worked just great for them. It might be something that you explore. Um, one of the nice things about it is you can uh, set up a schedule for when the messages go out. Um, it's very easy to set up uh, special messages, for example, when a club member passes away and you want to pass information out about that or to remind people. But um, there are a lot of, of uh, programs like this. Now, this one does have a cost. I think that the uh, Homer Radford told me it's about a little bit less than $150 for their club per year. But he said it has really made a difference in terms of communicating uh, effectively with all their club members. So. Just want to share that with you there. Okay, let me see if I can get back to uh, my slides here. Okay, there we go. So, lots of opportunities there. Let's go. What's going on? Okay, let me try something here. 
Okay, here we go. Oh boy, this could be trouble. I can't get my slides back up here. What am I doing wrong here? Let's cancel and try again. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, what should be communicated in your newsletter? You know, I think the most important thing is a reminder for upcoming events, uh, schedule changes, deaths or illnesses, you know, prayer requests, priest anniversary, seminary and birthdays, and current officers with email addresses so that uh, somebody can just pass it out as a way uh, to encourage people to join. Now let's talk about newsletters here. Um, you know, the purpose is twofold. It's, it's both informational and motivational. And uh, I think I would really encourage a simple design and I would really encourage large, large type for easy reading. When I was much younger, I liked to condense as much as I could, but as I've gotten older, um, I really appreciate large type. Uh, send it at the same time every month, have upcoming events, which are, is the most important part of the newsletter. And I'd never hold it up uh, for anything except to finalize upcoming events. A lot of clubs do a hard copy that's mailed to homes, even if they email it generally at least once a quarter. Um, consider obituaries of deceased members as articles in that newsletter and include board minutes. And I, what I've done here on pages 9A uh, and following is to, I just pulled some old newsletters of things I really like. So let me go through these. 9A is a, a 9B are a two page newsletter from the Sarah Club of Council Bluffs, Iowa. And one of the things that struck me about this newsletter, first, it was it's very simple, but it's very effective. But I was really struck by the fact that they made the lead article um, an obituary for one of their longtime members. And you know, I don't think we do enough in Sarah for those Sarans that pass away. And I think this is a great tribute, um, a great way to give tribute to a person who's been a longtime Saren. And then on the second page, again, it's very simple, but they have their upcoming dates. They call them dates to remember. Um, they have information about who the president is. Um, they have a website and they give that citation and they have an address to send stuff to. And they also have down here birthdays. Those are not Sarans, but those are seminarians I happen to know um, who actually are now priests. So um, <clears throat> it's uh, <clears throat> they get a lot of stuff in just a two page newsletter. And I just, I, but I really like putting that obituary in. And then uh, uh, 9C through, it's pretty extensive here. This is a kind of an opposite example of a very extensive newsletter. 9C through uh, 9L are uh, a, a newsletter from the North Minneapolis Club. I think we've got some folks on from there today. And again, this is uh, from August of 2020, but I liked it because um, they had a, a, a priest who was a chaplain for an extremely long period of time with the club who got transferred. And they basically did a really nice uh, feature article on the front page about that. And as you look to it, you can see some of the other things they talked about, but they have their club officers listed with uh, uh, phone numbers and also email addresses in case people want to get in contact with them. They had an article on St. Sarah. Uh, they've got several little articles. Um, I want to flip back here to uh, page 9K. Uh, 9K has, this is something I think they put out either either every quarter or once a month, but it's basically, it's a, it's a table, and we talked about this a little bit last week in the vocations talk, but it's basically a table of all the priests in the parish and each priest has been assigned to a particular day of the month. So there's a lot of people that pray daily for vocations, and this gives them some specific people to pray for on a certain day, so that by the time they're done, they've covered all the priests in the parish there. And then the very last page is something that I think more clubs should do, but they actually include <clears throat> the, uh, the board meeting minutes from the prior board meeting. And I think that that does a great deal to create transparency and to keep people informed of uh, what a SARA club is up to. And then finally, pages 9M and 9N and O and P 
uh, are examples from another club, the Dubuque Sarah Club in Dubuque, Iowa. And they're more, this is a more typical layout that I've seen, but it starts with a president's message. But the second page, uh, page 9N in this case, is basically minutes from their board meeting. They have a board meeting every month, and they publish those board minutes as part of the newsletter. And again, I think it uh, it's an extremely well-informed club from what I know. I used to be their district governor. And part of the reason is that they share those minutes with everybody and includes you know, what, what's the current balance and the checking account, all kinds of things that people might want to know there. So I just give those as examples. They're not, I wouldn't say there aren't better newsletters, um, and I wouldn't say there aren't worse. I just think they do a good job of covering the basics, and I wanted to share some of their strengths with you. So that's newsletters for right now. Uh, well, I just want to mention that there is a SARA newsletter award program. Any club is eligible, and you just have to submit two consecutive newsletters between September 1st, uh, I've got the, the dates incorrect there, but 2021 and August 2022. And I think those go to the communications vice president, Jesse Gallegos. And then they announced those uh, the following January at the SARA rally. And uh, there's more information that'll come back about those that contest that comes up here and who to submit it to. And just remember, final thoughts on internal communications. Communication is, totally depends on, off, on the officer team passing information to the vice president of communications in a timely manner. Like I've always said, uh, you know, you could have the best communications officer in the world, and if the other officers aren't doing their job, there's nothing to communicate that's meaningful. So, and remember that the best communication effort cannot overcome poor planning. So you need to have good planning to start with there. Okay, we're going to shift real quickly here to external club communications. We've already talked about these, but this would be publicity outside the club in the Catholic community. Um, diocesan newspaper articles, Catholic radio, diocesan vocations websites. You know, a lot of vocations, almost all dioceses have their own website, and a lot of those will give a page or some kind of a sub listing for the Sarah Club if they want it. You got to check and see if that's possible. Um, the, a lot of clubs have their own website, but again, it's important to keep those up. Uh, Sunday bulletins are a great way just to put the Sarah message out there. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are examples. Now, uh, this last, uh, really one of the last significant slides here, I got to tell you about uh, something you got to be very careful with, particularly if you have websites. We run into this problem. We had a club in, I think it was Texas, who was sued for a copyright violation, and they were asking for $4,000 from the club because they had picked up a picture of, say, of Pope Francis on the internet and put it on their website. Well, as soon as they got notified, they took it down, and, and I don't know if they ever ended up paying anything. They basically told the guys they didn't have any money to pay. But it is important to realize that not everything on the web is free. And you need to realize that right up front. You got to be real careful about, especially picking up pictures or artwork. Um, so if they're copyrighted, you could be required to pay a fee um, under U.S. law. So the way to do that is just avoid picking up anything unless you know that it's free. And one place to go to is Wikimedia Commons. That's an online repository of free use images, so that we know that there are no copyright uh, issues there. But the best place, I think, is to look on your own diocesan website because the pics that they have, they're, they're much more careful. Uh, they are an organization that has money, and so they've been targeted by a lot of these people. And what you want to do is you could want to get their permission to make sure it's okay to do. But in general, um, that's a good place, a good source where you can feel safe in what you're doing. Okay, we have covered in record time communications. Are there any questions or comments from anybody about that? Somebody must have this is Kathleen. Hey, I'm Kathleen. driving. Um, sorry, I, like I said, I have a different time frame than everybody else. Yep. A lot of you. But anyway, the question is, is could you send, us a, send me if I requested a copy of a formatted um, newsletter? You know what uh, I'm saying? Yeah, Kathleen, you said, can I send you a, a, a format for a newsletter? 
Yeah. I, I really can't, but I could send you some samples. I, I'd, I'd recommend you look, look at those three samples. I think that the Communications Committee, the U.S. Communications Committee, is looking at some templates that clubs can use to create newsletters. Okay, um, great. The person to contact there would be Jesse Gallegos, but in the meantime, the three samples that I provided, one is very simple, one is kind of uh, average in terms of length, and one is very lengthy, very extensive, I think would give you some good ideas of what, what you could do if you wanted to. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Let's close here. Um, I'm going to do an inspirational reading from, again, from Father Brett Brandon's book. This particular passage is called Priests Celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. After Mass one Sunday, an elderly woman came up to me, accompanied by one of her grown daughters, and asked, Father, did you see anything unusual today during the Mass? I replied, no, but what did you see? She said, Father, I don't want you to think that I'm crazy but I saw angels today during the consecration. I was kneeling and trying to pray, and when I looked up, I saw something like white circles of light on each side of the altar. There were four on each side, and they were moving up and down as if in adoration of Jesus. I kept closing my eyes and reopening them, thinking that I was seeing things, but they didn't go away. I even nudged my daughter and told her to look, but she thought I was crazy. She didn't see anything. After you consumed the Eucharist and started giving Holy Communion to the people, the angels disappeared. Father, do you think I'm nuts? Do I need to go see a psychiatrist? I smiled and assured the woman that she was not crazy. I said, angels are always present during Mass. Everywhere that Jesus is, his angels are there in adoration, and he is certainly present in the Eucharistic sa sacrifice. Now, why the Lord gave you that special grace of being able to see them, I don't know. But just thank God for the grace and don't worry about it. She left, seemingly satisfied with my answer. A few days later, I got a call early in the morning from the grown daughter. She told me that her mother had a massive stroke and was taken to the hospital. When I arrived, the entire family of six children was standing around her bed in ICU, and they told me that she was dying. The stroke was very severe, and there was no way she could recover. I gave her the sacrament of the anointing of the sick and the apostolic pardon, and then we prayed the rosary. Finally, I closed with the prayers for the dying. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. May she, rest, may she rest in peace. Amen. And may her soul and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. The moment I finished those words, the lines on the heart and brain monitors went straight. Even I was amazed. She died at the very moment we finished the prayers. There was a young doctor standing in the room, an intern, and he spoke to me out in the hall. He said, Father, I am not a Catholic, and I don't even have much religion. But I have to say that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I replied, Jesus is real. He is real. I often wonder about that holy woman's vision during Mass on her last Sunday on earth. Perhaps it was the Lord's way of telling her that he was proud of the way she had lived her life, raising her children in the faith. I will ask the Lord that question when I get to heaven. This is just what priests do. Okay, good story too, I think. Um, let's finish with a prayer. Again, if you'll follow along silently. Uh, this is a prayer that was composed by Pope John the Twenty-Third. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus. Send laborers into your fields, which are awaiting holy apostles, saintly priests, heroic missionaries, and dedicated sisters and brothers. And kindle in the hearts of men and women the spark of a vocation. Grant that Christian families may desire to give to your church helpers in the work of tomorrow. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I am going to uh, stop the recording, but I'm going to stay online if anybody has a question or a comment that they didn't have time to get uh, 